This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Risk and uncertainty. Um, and most of it, as you'll see, is decision making when there's risk and uncertainty. And I'll explain the difference between risk and uncertainty in a moment. But because most of it is decision making, somebody to explain what the problem is. That's something I wrote up earlier. Suppose I gave you a choice between two machines. So two machines both do the same job, but you know they have different costs involved. And machine A ends up giving us uh, a profit of twenty thousand a year. Uh, B gives us a profit of thirty thousand a year. And I said, which will you choose? Well, there's no tricks, and the answer's obvious. You'd pick the one with the highest profit. You'd pick B. But there is because we're certain what the returns will be. Suppose instead I told you you have two machines to choose from, but the profits you'll get depend on what the level of demand for our product is. And we're not sure what the level's going to be. Uh, the product may be uh, very successful and we get high demand and make high profits. Oh, the product may not be very successful at all, and we end up with low demand. And we've, you know, done various costings and things. We've decided if the sales, if there's low demand, that's what the profits will be per year. But on the other hand, if the product's successful and there's high demand, the profits will be a lot higher. Uh, a will give us a hundred thousand a year instead of twenty. B is a different cost structure. Um, it gives thirty if there's low demand. If there's high demand, it'll give more, but it'll give eighty. Now then, tell me which one would you take? And there's no sort of best machine. Because obviously, if you knew demand was going to be low, you would pick B. You'd rather have 30 than 20. If you knew demand would be high, uh, you'd have picked A. 100 is against 80. But what are we going to do? Well, it all depends on your attitude to risk. We are uncertain as to what the results are going to be. And it depends on your attitude. Uh, for instance, you might say, I'm not going to take the risk here. Uh, you might decide you'll pick B, simply because if the worst happens, you'll get most. You know, whatever happens, you're guaranteed to get 30,000. You can't do any worse. All right, you may do better, but at least you'll get at least 30,000. And I don't know, if these were millions, and it was me personally deciding, I'm not greedy. I'd rather have a guaranteed 30 million uh, than take a risk uh, 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 and end up uh, only, uh, or I may get only 20 million. So you might take that approach. Uh, on the other hand, especially if these were relatively small amounts, if these were just cents, I might say, oh, I'll go for A. You know, that gives me the chance of getting 100,000. All right, I may only get 20, you know, but no problem. But, you know, everybody's different. It all depends on your attitude to risk and the amount of money involved. As you'll see as we go through, there are several ways you can go about making your decision effectively. I've just shown you two ways, but I'll, I'll do it more formally shortly. There are several ways. There's no best way of deciding. It depends on the amounts involved and on your attitude to risk. Uh, and in the exam, you won't be asked which is the best way. You wouldn't, they wouldn't say which is the best of those two machines. They expect you to be aware of various different criteria you could use and say, ah, if we made the decision this way, which would you choose? If we made it that way, which would you choose? And so on. Uh, before we go, I'll go into a full example. 
I, I've already effectively told you two ways we might make a decision, but let me show you a third. So as we've got that information, but somehow I'd managed to find out the probabilities of the demands being high or low. I've done market research and things. And I think the probability of demand being low is 0.3. And the probability of demand being high is 0.7. And I, again, I said, uh, which would you prefer? Well, what you could do, another approach, would be to say, ah, if we picked A, we'll either get 20 or 100 with those probabilities, and we could work out, um, effectively, a weighted average. For A, we'd say, ah, there's a 0.3 probability of getting 20,000, a 0.7 probability of getting 100. And we could say, well, the weighted average, multiply together and add up. A 0.3 times that is 6,000. 0.7 times that is 70,000. And say, ah, it's an average of 76,000. You know, uh, saying effectively, or oh, if we did it ten times, three times we'd get twenty, uh, seven times we'd get a hundred. Well, it would average out at seventy-six thousand each time. And if we did the same for B, well, a point three probability of getting thirty thousand, a point seven probability of getting eighty thousand is nine. Uh, 56, 65,000. Again, I do go back to my arithmetic right. And we could say, all right, with that extra information, A is like an average of 76, B is like getting an average of 65, and therefore, up, we choose A. Uh, and we call those averages the expected value And it gives us another basis for a decision. And a lot of people think, oh, oh, well, that's perfect. That's the best way of all, if you've got that information about probabilities. But in fact, it isn't. And it's not a perfect way. It's a way of making a decision. But if, you, if this was something you were going to do, you know, 10 times, then perhaps on average, A would give you 76, B would give you 65, A would be better. But this isn't a long run thing, you know, we're picking a machine. You either pick A, finished, and you get 20 or you get 100, or you pick B, finished, you either get 30 or you get 80. You know, for one-off decisions, it's a way of making the decision, but you cannot tell me that's the best way. Um, because I say again, if you pick A, you won't get 76,000. We're only doing this machine once. You pick A and you will either get 20 and you'll be rather upset you've picked A, or you'll get 100 and you'll be pleased you picked A. But there we are. Now, I'm about to do a full example because it's not quite that easy uh, and give names to these different um, uh, methods we could use. But I say again, there is no best way of making a decision. Depends on the uh, attitude uh, to the risk. It depends on the amounts of money involved. Uh, in the exam, you make the decision whichever way you are told to make it. Uh, before I do do the example, uh, the, the chapter ended up risk and uncertainty. Well, it, it does say on the first page, um, risk is where we can actually quantify it. Uncertainty. Um, where it's not as well defined. So here, when I use expected values, we can actually measure it. We know the returns, we know the probabilities. You know, there's a set number of returns. It's either 20, 100, 30, 80. 
So this is a, a situation where we could say it's risk. Uncertainty, more likely in real life, um, you won't be able to put numbers to all the figures. You know, the return from A is uncertain, could be anything. Um, you're unlikely to be able to say it's going to be precisely this or precisely that and so on. Anyway, there we are. Let's look at the proper example. Uh, there is a tiny exercise one which I'm not going to do. It's repeating what we did here effectively. Not as good as what I did here. I'm going to go straight into a full example where I'll explain the different ways of making a decision that you're expected to be aware of. Um, it's uh, paragraph six, exercise two. Have a read with me and uh, then we'll work through it. John has a factory capacity of 1,200 units a month. So that's the most we're capable of making. Units cost $6 each to make and our normal selling price is $11, so we're going to make $5 a unit profit. However, the demand per month is uncertain and is as follows. It's either going to be 400, 500, 700 and 900 with those probabilities. However, we've been approached by a customer who's prepared contract to a fixed quantity per month at a price of $9 a unit. Now remember the units cost us $6. So if we sell to this customer, uh, we'll only make $3 a unit profit, but he's going to sign a contract to buy a fixed amount each month. So, you know, we're going to be guaranteed sales, so for that reason, uh, perhaps I'm happy to accept a lower profit. Uh, he's prepared to sign a contract to buy three, five, seven, or eight hundred units a month. We can vary production levels during the month up to maximum capacity, uh, but we can't carry forward any unused uh, units in inventory. And so remember, the most we can ever make is 1,200. Subject to that, we'll vary the level, we'll produce what we're going to sell. And it wants us to calculate all possible profits that could result and determine for what quantity should we sign the contract. Uh, worry about part C later. Well, let's look at part A. Calculate all possible profits that could result. Well, what's going to affect the profit? Two things. Firstly, it'll depend on what we sign the contract for. If we sign a contract for 300 units, then of course we're guaranteed to sell 300 units at that low price. But in addition, we've got the normal demand, which might be four, five, seven, or 900. So the profit we make each month will depend on how many we've contracted to sell and in addition how many normal people want. And so let's set up a table showing all the possibilities that we could end up with. Now you set up your table any way you like, that will be the way I like. It depends first of all on what size contract we sign. Uh, we can sign a contract, there's four choices here, it'll either be for 300 units, 500 units, 700 or 800. Uh, but it'll also depend on normal demand. And the normal demand might be, where are we, 400 units. 500 units, 700, 900. And the eventual profit we end up with depends on which combination of those there are. Uh, you know, do we contract 300 and sell 400 to normal customers, or 
do we contract 700 and normal customers want 700 and so on? It could depend. So let's work out in each case how much profit we'd end up with. Um, our label, I'm not going to do workings for every single one of them because it's fairly repetitive. Uh, but our label and show workings for some of them. Suppose that's what's happened. Suppose we sign a contract for 300 and ordinary customers want 400. How much will we make? Well, the contract customers. Look back, uh, remember units are costing us six dollars each and the contract, any we sell to that customer, the price is nine dollars and so we're making three dollars profit. So anything sold on the contract we're making three dollars whereas normal customers, if they want four hundred, well normal customers are paying eleven dollars, the cost is six so on those, we make $5 profit. And so if that happens, we're selling 700 units. And remember, we can vary production to meet demand. So we'll only produce 700. And we'd end up with a total profit of 2,900. Um, I said I'm not going to show workings for all of them. Uh, but let's do another two or three. Let's do this one. Uh, normal, uh, sorry, contract want 500 and normal customers want 500. Well, on the contract, 500, they make $3 a unit profit. Normal customers, they want 500 as well. They make $5 profit. So total 4,000. I said it a moment ago, it's very repetitive. Once we get into it, uh, it, it becomes speed. However, let's look at one more. What about this one? Suppose we decided to sign a contract for 800 and ordinary customers wanted 900. Well, if we sign the contract for 800, we have to supply 800. The contract sales make $3. Normal customers want 900, but we have a problem. Because remember, the first line of the question said, our capacity is 1,200 units a month. So we can only make 1,200 units a month. If we sign the contract, we've got to supply that customer with his 800. And it means that we're only capable of producing another 400. So even though ordinary customers want to buy 900, we can only sell 400 to them. The rest will have to go away. We can't produce more than 1200 in total. So those 400 to normal customers Remember, they make five dollars a unit. And so the total there would be 4,400. All right, well, I hope you've seen what's happening. Uh, on that basis, I think it'd be better, rather than me talk for every single one, I think it'd be better if you paused the, this video uh, for a few minutes and filled in the rest yourself and then uh, switch back on and check with me. Um, anyway, I don't know. If you have paused then uh, and you've restarted, then check. If you couldn't be bothered, ooh, uh, watch me. I'm not going to write down the workings for the rest, though. Uh, I'll do it. I'll speak it and write them down. If I speak too fast, you'll have to uh, think about it and ask in the Ask the Tutor forums. Uh, but 300 and 500. Contract 300 at three dollars. Oops. 303 dollars is 900. 500 at uh, five dollars is 2,500. So a total of 3,400. 700 with an extra 200 to normal at five dollars. That would be 4,400. 
Uh, and 900, again, it'd be an extra 200 to ordinary customers, that would be 5,400. If we contract 500, we're getting 1,500 from the um, contract, together with 400 at $5, 2,000. So in total, we'll get 3,500. Um, we've already calculated earlier that if um, normal wants 500, it's 4,000. If normal wants 700, that's an extra 200 to normal, an extra 1,000, it's 5,000. Uh, but if they want 900, we can't supply. Remember, the maximum we can produce is 1,200. So if there's 500 to the contract, fine, we can sell the other 700 to normal. If they want 900, we can still only sell them 900, so it's 5,000. Uh, 700 on the contract, $3, that's 2,100. If there's 400 to uh, normal customers, uh, that's 2,000. So 4,100 in total. Uh, if normal 100, that's uh, 500, that's an extra 100. If normal 500, so it's 4,600. But again, at that stage, 700 to contract, 500 to normal, that's our maximum capacity. So if normal want more, we can't sell them more. We can still only sell them the 500. Uh, and finally, if the contract's 800, then uh, in fact we've already done the workings because since we can only contract uh, make rather 1,200 in total, then however many normal demand, we can only sell them at 400. And so whatever the demand, that uh, makes no difference, we'll end up with 4,400. So there we are, that is part A, and that is obviously the time consuming part, it's very easy when you're rushing to make silly mistakes, but otherwise it's a question of just reading carefully. More importantly though, is how are we going to decide, So I'm trying to make space and it's a bit too cluttered, how are we going to decide what decision to make? Okay, now let's uh, look at part B, uh, where uh, we need to learn the decision-making rules. We've got all those profits, and of course the level of profit we make depends on what we decide. We decide on the contract size, and we need to decide which one we want, whereas the normal, level, normal demand is uncertain. Uh, and I said before, there's no best way of making the decision. In the exam, you do whichever way or ways you're told to use. Um, and there are four. If you look at part B, and I'll do them in the order there, there's expected value, max and min, max and max and minimax regret. So I'll work through each in turn and make the decision um, using each of the four rules that are involved. And the first way, when I already showed you with my little simple example earlier, is expected value. Uh, and for expected value, we need to know the probabilities of each of the possible returns. And we do, because we know the probabilities of the uncertain demand. It's 0.2 for 400. 500 has a probability of 0 0.3. 700, a probability of 0 0.4. Uh, and 900, a probability of 0.1. So for each possible choice, each contract size, let's work out the average or the expected uh, return. So let's go through one by one. Uh, first of all, if we contract for 300, we're going to get, depending on the demand, we'll get either 2,900, 3,400, 4,400, or 5,400, and we know the probabilities that go with each of them, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. Uh, 
And to get the expected uh, return, the expected value, we multiply by the probabilities and add up. So uh, 29 times 0 0.2 is 580. 3,400 times 0 0.3 is, for some reason, I always tend to get this wrong, 1,020. 4,400 times 0 0.4 is 1,760. 5,400 times 0 0.1 is 540. And so the total, the expected value, is 580, 1,020, 1,760. 540, 3,900. Uh, what if we uh, chose 500, if we contracted for 500? We're either going to get 3,500, 4,000, 5,000, or 5,000. Again, the probabilities, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. Uh, multiply and add, it gives us 700, 1,200, 2,000, 500. The total, uh, 1939, is it 4,400? 7,941, yeah. What happens if we contract 700? Uh, it's 4,100, 46, 46, 46, 0 0.2, 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 820, uh, 1880, 1840, 4500. Uh, in fact, you may have realised, I hope you did, I could have saved a few seconds there. Instead of multiplying 4,600 by 0.3 and then by 0.4 and then by 0.1, I could have done those last three in total by multiplying 4,600 by the total of them by 0.8. Uh, finally, though, what if we contract for 800? Well, I hope you realise there we don't need to keep multiplying and adding. Surely, check me if you don't believe me. But since they all give 4,400, we'll get 4,400 whatever. So, I should have headed this up. These, I'm doing the expected value approach. On expected values, work out the average, the expected return for each of the four choices. Whichever's the highest is the best, uh, and the highest is 4,000. 500, and therefore the decision we'd contract to make 700, not to make a big problem, to sell 700. So there we are. Okay, no problem. Contract for 700 and expect it for 5, except as I said before. That'd be fine if it was something that kept repeating. Uh, you know, some weeks we um, sold 400, some weeks we sold uh, 500, 700, 900. Uh, as a one-off, um, it's a problem. And the other problem, of course, is getting the probabilities themselves in real life. How on earth are you going to be certain that those probabilities are correct? Uh, and any change in the probabilities uh, could, very obviously, I hope, end up giving us a different decision. Okay, that was expected values. Let's turn to the next one, which I say I'll do them in the same order. Maxi min. And actually, because I keep needing the table to avoid making you dizzy, 
going up and down. Let me clear this. If you've lost it, then we can always wind back. All this answers at the back of the uh, notes. But it's just otherwise to keep going up and down to the table. It's going to cause also awful confusion. No, the uh, second approach will take max C min. With max C min, what we do is this. It's sort of slightly pessimistic. We say that each course of action that we can choose, so here we're choosing contract size. In each case, we say what's the worst that can possibly happen, and we get the best of the worst. I'll write that down, but then I'll put the numbers to it. With maximum, for each course of action, or for each choice, we identify the worst outcome. And having identified the worst outcome in each case, we then choose whichever gives the best of these worst outcomes. Now it's very easy, you can almost do it um, just by looking at it, but to be certain, remember um, our choices, first of all, we could contract contract 300. What's the worst possible outcome? Well, if you contract 300, it'll be 293444454. The worst outcome is 2900. What happens if we contract for 500? Well, the worst possible outcome um, is that we get 3,500. And what about 700? Well, we're either going to get 4,1 or 4,6, so the worst that can happen is we get 4,1. And finally, if we contract for 800, well, of course, the worst that happens is we get 4,400. So there's the worst that can happen in each case. Um, and with a maximin approach, we take whichever action gives the highest, the best of the worst outcomes. So the best of those, the highest, is 4,400. And therefore, the decision we'd contract to sell 800. I gave the logic before, but let me repeat it that by uh, contracting 800, you're guaranteed to get at least 4,400. You can't possibly do any worse. You've lost the chance of doing better. You know, if, uh, oops, if we have contracted 300 and demanded 900, we could have got a lot more. So you've lost the chance of doing better, but you've guaranteed that you can't do any worse. And in fact, uh, people who make that sort of de the decision on that sort of basis, we say a risk avoiders. We're not prepared to take the risk of going for a higher return, because if we did contract 300, we could get a lot more, but there's a risk of getting a lot less. So there we are. Nice and easy, I think, maximum. Uh, note, you can see what's coming. The words all look very similar, so be careful that you don't do the wrong workings for the right requirement, if you see what I mean. But I think it should be clear why we call it maximin. We're picking the best, the maximum of the worst, the minimums. Maximum of the minimums. Okay, no problem. Let's look at the next one, Maxi Max. I said before, 
I'm doing this, then we um, don't have to keep moving up and down. Maxi max. Again, you'll see this actually is what is one you can write the answer straight down to, but to be certain of the exam, make sure you're clear what exactly it means and why. With maximax, for each of the choices, we identify the best outcome. And to make the decision, we choose the action that gives the best of the best outcomes. So again, let's use our table with four choices, remember. Our decision is three, five, seven, or eight, the contract, contract size. So if we contract first for 300, What's the best uh, outcome? It's two nine three four 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 five four. The best that we can achieve is five thousand four hundred. On the other hand, if we contract for uh, five hundred, three five four five five, the best we can get is five thousand seven hundred. Four one or four six is four six. Eight hundred. Well, of course, the best is four four. So there's the best outcome we could achieve in each case. We go for the best of the best. The highest of those is 5-4. And as a result, we would contract the 300. It's an easy one, and in fact, you, you, you can write that one straight down. Uh, you're always aiming for the best possible return. But at the same time, be clear why it's called Maxi Max. It's the, the, the maximum of the maximum. I think you see what I mean. And again, there is no best method. I'm sorry, well, I'm not sorry repeating because it's important. Uh, it all depends on the amounts involved and the attitude to risk. Because, of course, making the decision on this base is going for 300. The benefit's obvious. You've got a chance of getting the highest possible return, but you're taking a risk. Um, you could end up with the worst possible return. We're all different. It's the attitude to risk and the amounts of money involved. Uh, when I say attitude to risk, we say that people who make the decision this way are risk seekers. A risk seeker. Uh, <coughs> Precisely the reason I just said, you've got the chance of the best return, you're prepared to accept the risk of the worst. All right, well, so far so good. I hope you followed me, in, in which case you, I hope you'd agree. Um, maximin and maximax are very straightforward, it's just being careful you remember the words. Uh, and expected value obviously takes slightly longer. But I, I, I think it's easy enough. The last one, though, is a little bit odd. Minimax regret. And here, what I'm going to do is, sorry, just let me write down which one we're doing. Minimax regret. I'm going to leave uh, uh, our example for a second. I'm going to write up a tiny, tiny problem just to explain 
what we're going to do with minimax regret, the logic, it won't take many seconds, or minutes, but then I'll come back and do it on, on, on this full example of using our table. So, be patient again with me. A tiny, tiny little example. Suppose I told you we had a choice of two things. You know, maybe we can two machines, whatever. And for each choice, suppose there were just two possible outcomes. Uh, maybe it's the level of demand. There might be low demand or high demand. Uh, and if we choose choice A, we'll either get 10 or we'll get 100. Whereas if we go for choice B, we'll either get 9 or we'll get 10,000. And suppose we're a risk avoider, and therefore we're using um, the maximin criteria. Well, using the maximin rule, which one would you choose? Remember, with maximin, you say, ah, what's the worst outcome in each case? A, you get 10. B, the worst outcome is 9. And then you choose the best of the worst. You choose A. And I went through the logic, you're choosing A, because whatever happens, you're guaranteed to get at least 10. You can't do any worse. Now, although there's a logic to being a risk avoider, and that example is extreme deliberately, I think you'd be completely mad to choose A. Because A, you either get 10 or 100. B, OK, you might get a bit less, 9, but only a dollar less. And you have the chance of getting 10,000. Or make it more extreme. Suppose B gave $9.99. On maximum, you'd still pick A. We're going to get at least 10. Well, I'm sorry, I think just about anybody uh, would rather go for B. They're prepared to risk losing one cent when they've the chance of getting so much extra. And that's a problem that can be with maximin. And of course, the reason I certainly would choose B is that you're comparing, you're saying, oh, well, um, if demand's high, there's an extra 9,100. If demand's low, I lose a cent. You're comparing the two when you're making the decision. Uh, and so that's effectively what we do in Minimax Regret. We look to see how much are we losing if we've made the wrong decision. If it's low and I've picked B, we lose a cent. If it's high and I've picked A, we lose 9,100. I think you see what I mean. We're going to look at how much we lose if we make the wrong decision. So that's basically what we're going to do. But now let's do it on our example. And watch me very carefully. It's not arithmetically hard, but it's so easy to end up doing silly things because you've sort of half learnt it. The first thing we do, we take our profit table, which is what we've had there all along, and we rewrite it as what we call a regret table. So we set up the table again. The choice, remember, was the contract size, which was 3, 5, 7, and 8.
Uh, the uncertain bit was the normal demand, which was 400, 500, 700, and 900. And what we do is this. Again, watch me very carefully. We're not sure what the normal demand is going to be. But we say, first of all, I don't need those probabilities anymore. First of all, suppose it turns out to be 400. If it does turn out to be 400, what would have been the best decision? Clearly, the best choice would have been to contract for 800. So if we had contracted for 800, we've got the best possible result for that level of demand. And we've lost nothing with no regret. But if it was 400 and we'd chosen a contract size of 700, we'll only have got 4,100. We know we could have got 4,400. And so by having picked the wrong one, we've lost 300. 300. Which, remember, is 4,400 is what we could have got. 4,100 is what we have got if we'd chosen 700. Uh, what happens if we'd have contracted 500? We'll have had 3,500. We'll know we could have had 4,400 if we made the other choice. And so uh, we've lost, effectively, the difference. 4, 4 minus 3, 5 is 900. So in each case, we're saying how much have we lost by having uh, made the uh, wrong decision as against what we could have had if we'd made the right decision. And so finally on 400, if normal demand is 400, if we'd have chosen a contract size of 300, We'd have got 29. We could have got 4,400. And so we've lost the difference of 1,500. So in each case, there's the regret we'll feel, the loss we're effectively making by having made the wrong decision. Well, uh, all of that was done for. Um, Normal demand of 400, but of course normal demand might be 500. We do the same again. If normal demand was 500, the best decision would have been contract 700. That would have given us the highest uh, return. Uh, and if we had gone for 700, we've lost nothing. Uh, but if normal demand was 500 and we've gone for any of the other contract sizes, we've lost out. If we'd gone for three, uh, 300, we'd only have got 3.4. We could have had 4.6. We've lost the difference of 1,200. If we'd gone for 500, we'll have got 4,000. We could have had 4.6. We've lost the difference of 600. And finally, if we'd gone for 800, we'll have had 4.4. We could have had 4.6. We've lost the difference of 200. So by now you should be seeing what's happening, but let's finish the other two off. Uh, if uh, normal demand is 700, the best choice would have been contract 500 with about 5,000, no regret. But the others, the difference between what we'd have got and the 5,000 we could have got. So uh, 5,000 less 4,4 4 is 600. 5,000 less 4, 6 is 400. 5,000 less 4, 4 is 600. And finally, we go through each of the uncertain amounts individually. But finally, what happens if the um, normal demand was 900? The best we could have got was 5, 4 by contracting 300. If we'd contracted 300, no regret. The other is the regret is the difference between what we'd have got and what we could have got. 
So at 5,000, we'd have lost 400 as against 5,4. For 6, uh, we'd have lost 800. And 5,844 four would have lost us 1,000. Now, we've not made the decision yet. I'm about to do that. And that the decision making itself isn't hard, uh, but it's setting up that regret table. Um, do, do make sure you've made sense of it. However, having done that, now we'll make the decision. And what we do, and the reason it's called Minimax Regret, we are a risk seeker. And so, just like uh, Maxim in earlier, we identify the worst outcome in each case. And we choose the best of the worst outcomes. And so let's go through the contract sizes. If we contracted 300, well, looking at the regret table, remember these are now effectively losses. Depending on the level of demand, we either are effectively losing 1500 or 1200 or 600 or zero. Well, the worst is the biggest loss, which is 1500. Similarly, if you contract for 500, the regret, in a sense the loss, is either 900, 600 or 400. The worst, the biggest loss is 900. If you contract 700, the worst is 800. If you contract 800, you either lose 0 or 200 or 600 or 1,000. The worst is you lose 1,000. The best of the worst, well again, since these are in a sense losses, the best of the worst is the smallest, which is 800, and therefore you'd contract for 700. And there we are. Uh, and I said before, you know, obviously learn the names, don't get them muddled. But I think you can see why it's called Minimax Regret, um, because we've done the regret table. We're making the decision based on the regrets. So the best of the worst, the best was the minimum of the maximum regrets. Minimax. So there you have it for part B. Four different uh, approaches. I've kept uh, clearing the screen because I kept needing to go back to the table. So I, I can't remember what all the different choices, what we ended up choosing. Uh, but four different ways of approaching it. And for the last time, there is no best way, you cannot be asked which is the best way, you know, which is the best of those uh, four choices. Um, it depends on the attitude to risk, the amounts involved. Uh, you make the choice depending on whether you're being asked to use maximum, maximax or whatever. All right, we've still not finished this example, there is a part C. Uh, part C, it's going to be the same figures, but because it look at it a slightly different way, um, I'll stop this lecture and we'll carry on with part C in, in the next lecture. But keep this example and the profit table in front of you. Uh, we are going to need it. But in the next lecture, I'll explain what part C is asking um, and how we sort it out.